Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. This is a Catholic variety program broadcasting on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio in lovely Jackson, Michigan. And as always, I am your host, Philip Campbell. Thank you so much for joining us again for another episode of Faith Matters. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, uh, the, the book begins with this wonderful passage. It says, quote, In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And in today's program, we're going to talk about, or at least begin to talk about, some of the ways that God speaks to us. It says that he's spoken to us through his Son. How, uh, what does the scripture mean by that? How are some ways that God speaks to us? So we're going to dive into this concept of divine revelation and talk about, uh, talk about the way that God communicates with us through the written word, that is through the sacred scriptures. And I don't know if we're going to get through everything I wanted to say, uh, depending on how, how deep we dive, we might have to come back and do, do further episodes on this subject, but that's okay. There should be no limit to how, how long we want to talk about the scriptures or the divine uh, revelation of God. It's a subject we could contemplate and explore endlessly. But I use the, the phrase divine revelation, and you'll, you'll come across this phrase a lot if you study Catholic theology. The Catechism uses it over and over again. Uh, what is divine revelation? Well, divine revelation means that certain truths of our faith come to us not as a result of human reasoning or from study, but that they have been revealed to us supernaturally by God. And that without God telling us these truths, we would not have known them. So there are things that are revealed to us directly by God and that we really needed God to reveal in order for us to know them. Not everything is like that. Uh, there's some things we can know about God from reason alone. For example, we can look at the universe, we can look at the world and the marvelous complexity of, 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 of life, and we can say, okay, God is, God is all-powerful if God created these things. He's all-wise and all-knowing if he, if he has the ability to bring forth this marvelously complex system that is the universe. We can figure that out from reason alone, even if God had never told us. However, something like that God is a trinity, or that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, or that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, or the particulars of the Last Judgment, or the Immaculate Conception, these are truths that we would not have known had not God revealed them to us. Now, that's not to say just because we, we need revelation to know these truths, that's not to say they go against reason or that they are unreasonable or illogical by any means. When you have something like the Trinity or the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, what you're dealing with are truths that go beyond reason, but they don't contradict reason. That is to say they're logical according to the dictates of reason, but they're not provable by reason. I could never prove to you by reason and logic alone that God is a trinity, even though I could offer, uh, I, I could offer uh, examples that tried to, to help you understand it, I couldn't actually uh, prove it. So because of this, God has chosen to give us this knowledge directly by means of a divine revelation. Uh, and that's what the Catechism teaches. If, if you have a Catechism, I encourage you to look up uh, paragraph 50, which says that, that we can know God with certainty from reason alone, but there's another order of knowledge that, that we as humans cannot possibly arrive at by our own power. That's the order of divine revelation, through which a very free decision, uh, utterly free decision, God reveals himself and gives himself to mankind by revealing the mystery of of his loving goodness uh, formed from all eternity in Christ. And this is revealed by the sending of his son. So you can look up the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 50. Now, why was it necessary for God to, uh, why was it necessary for us, I should say, for God to reveal himself in this way? St. Thomas Aquinas has a very nice synopsis on this, on why it was necessary for us that God should communicate to us directly. 
Uh, why didn't God just, you know, we, we learn so much about the world through nature, through human reason, through the sciences. Why didn't just God let us grope our way towards him that way? Why did he feel the need to make a direct communication to humankind? St. Thomas says there's three reasons. Uh, number one, very basic, since man is ordered towards God, it's very fitting that God should reach out and try to communicate with human beings in a way that we can understand. This is just common sense. If you're in a relationship with someone, if you're oriented towards your wife or your children, don't you think you should talk to them? <laughs> Right. If we're in, if, if God wants to be in a relationship with us, it's fitting that he communicates with us in a way that we can understand. But also the second reason, since our reason is not perfect, it's fitting that God, that God's truth should be told to us in a way that we can understand by God himself so we can know that it's free from error. Human beings can exercise reason, but our reason is far from perfect. Has anybody ever made an error in judgment? Anybody out there ever came to a wrong conclusion? Anybody ever misjudged the evidence? Of course, we all have at one point or another. Our reasoning faculty is not perfect. So because of that, uh, it's fitting that God himself should communicate with us to some extent so that we can understand what he wants us to know free from error because God does not uh, God is not capable of error. He is not capable of lying. He He does not... Uh, he does not communicate errantly or make bad judgments. So the fact that God communicates directly gives us a certainty of what we are believing. Now, the third reason why God communicates with us is that even about those things that we could know about God with certainty from reason alone, like that he's all-powerful or that he's, uh, that he's all-knowing, it would take such a depth of thought and time to arrive at these conclusions that few people would have the time or perseverance to do so. Basically, knowledge of God would be restricted to a few philosophers who had all the time in the world to sit around philosophizing about the divine attributes and seeing what they could come up with, what, what conclusions they could arrive at from reason alone. And very few people are going to have the time or the inclination to do that. And even if they did do that, uh, would their conclusions even be correct? Wouldn't it be mixed, you know, uh, kind of diluted with some admixture of error due to the inherent, uh, inherent uh, imperfections of, of human reason? So God wants everybody, all humankind, to have access to him, to know about him. He doesn't want his knowledge, knowledge of him to be restricted to a few philosophers. And so for this reason, it's fitting that even those things that we can know about from reason alone, like that God is powerful— uh, God still wanted to communicate to us uh, directly to, to make it easier on us. So therefore, it's helpful, very helpful for humankind, for God to take the initiative to communicate with us, to, to have what theology calls a divine revelation. That is a revealing of the divine by God himself to humankind. Okay, so <clears throat> we can understand then why it is helpful and necessary for us that God should communicate directly. The question then becomes, how does God make this communication? How does God choose to reveal himself? Now, the Catholic faith teaches that divine revelation comes to us in two distinct modes, two modes of transmission. See, the revelation, the divine revelation is a revealing of God, a revealing of God's truth. And what we're looking at now is how this truth is communicated to us. And the church says there's two distinct ways. The first is through the writings of the Holy Scriptures. That would be uh, a written revelation. And the second would be through the traditions of the church. That is the thing, the practices, the beliefs, uh, even in some senses the piety and the, the art that is unwritten. So you have... Uh, you have a revelation that is written and then an unwritten revelation, the tradition. And these two together form one body of revelation, form the divine revelation. And the Catechism and Catholic Theology calls this the deposit of faith. Maybe you've heard this before, talking about uh, the, the deposit of faith. The deposit of faith is everything that God wants to say to mankind, whether through the scriptures or through the tradition of the church. So there's these two different modes of of transmission of divine revelation, but what's important to understand is they both have one common source. They both come from God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this in paragraph 80. It says, quote, 
both of them, that is scripture and tradition, flowing out of the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal, end quote. So our scriptures and our tradition come from a single divine wellspring, says the catechism. That is one single revelation of God. And that's why for a Catholic, it's really inappropriate for us to pit, uh, to pit scripture against tradition. Now, obviously not every tradition has the same value. Uh, some traditions are just local traditions, customs with a particular region or even uh, parish. We're talking about we're talking about big traditions, uh, things that have come down from from and the antiquity of the church, like fasting for forty days during Lent, or going to mass on Sunday, or saying the Lord's prayer in the liturgy, or uh, clerical celibacy, or things like that. It's very wrong to to take the tradition and pit it against the scriptures. Because the tradition and the scriptures both come from the same source. The truths that come to us through the scriptures and from the tradition are meant to be complementary. They come from the same source, and as the Catechism says, they move towards the same goal. They're both revealing the, uh, the, the, same, uh, the same God uh, with the end goal of getting us towards heaven. So we have to remember that the scripture and the tradition go together. One divine re revelation with two distinct modes of, uh, of transmission and they're not to be pitted against one another. Now, the supreme revelation of God is, of course, Jesus Christ. If you were to ask what is the, the center of God's revelation, the center of that revelation is the person of Jesus Christ, the supreme revelation of God in whom God has said everything. That's what that passage from Hebrews says at the beginning of the program I quoted. It says, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our forefathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son. So the son of God is the, the central revelation of God. Christ is the message. Christ is not only the messenger, he is the message himself. Uh, we talk about the Bible as God's word, right? We talk about the word of God as the Bible, but Jesus Christ himself is, is the perfect, unsurpassable word of God. Jesus Christ is one of the, the, the names of Christ, says in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Christ himself is the supreme communication. There's this lovely quote from St. John of the Cross, the 16th century Carmelite saint and mystic. He says, quote, In giving us his son, his only word, God spoke everything to us at once, in this sole word, and he has no more to say, because what he spoke before to the prophets in part, he's now spoken all at once by giving us the all who is his son. That's a very lovely summary of how Christ, what it means to say that Christ is the word or the communication of God the Father. Now, given that Jesus Christ is the supreme central revelation of God, um, the church has always understood that there's there's not going to be any further new revelation now. That's to say, how do you know that, uh, you know, you've got Christ comes, he delivers his message, he dies on the cross, founds the church. How are we to know that at some point in the future, some other individual isn't going to be sent by God and say, hey, uh, all that stuff Jesus said and did, that was great, but I'm, I'm sent by God now and I have a new message. I have an updated message, a gospel 2.0, right? A new version of... Of, uh, of the gospel. God wanted to send another messenger, and he's updating the message. How do we know that's not going to happen? Well, because Christ himself is the definitive message. He is the centerpiece, the, the pivot, the axis around which all of divine revelation turns, and as a result, the, the Christian message that comes to us through Christ is the new and definitive covenant that will never pass away. And so our faith teaches us that divine revelation ceased with the death of the last apostle. That is, uh, revelation came to us through Christ and the apostles that carried on his, his message. And with the death of the last apostle, that was it. There's no new divine revelation to be expected. No new public revelation is coming. Uh, the next time there's going to be a, a public revelation uh, uh, of God, a, a new divine revelation is going to be at the second coming, when, when Christ appears like lightning that flashes from the east to the west, and every eye shall see it, says the scriptures. So, um, so there's not going to be any new public revelation 
uh, everything was said in Christ and in the uh, and explicated by the apostles that Christ commissioned. So we're not looking for new revelation, but what we are looking at is uh, the job of of us as Catholics and the Church is to gradually grasp the full significance of the revelation that was delivered once and for all. So we take that one revelation that was delivered uh, through the Old Testament and then in Christ and the Apostles, and what we do is we we reflect on it, we ponder it, we unpack it, we examine it, we follow it to its logical conclusions. We basically spend our lives and our history delving into it, applying it to our various life circumstances in such a way that the revelation is ever ever fresh, ever life-giving, ever applicable to what's going on in our lives and in the world, but still remaining the same revelation, still unchanging. Our doctrine, our teachings, they, they develop, they unfold, they blossom, but they do not change. It is, it is one and the same revelation. Now, perhaps when I said there was not going to be any new public revelation, perhaps you started thinking of situations like Fatima or Lourdes, where there was a very public communication of the divine, either from Christ or the Blessed Virgin Mary to people. And you say, well, what about that? Uh, you know, what happened at Fatima with the miracle of the sun was, was very public. How can you say there's not going to be any more public revelation? Well, uh, we have to understand what the Church means by public versus private revelation. Uh, the Catechism contrasts public revelation with private revelation. So it says, uh, we'll just quote the Catechism here, uh, paragraph 67. Through 68, it says, quote, Throughout the ages, there have been so-called private revelations, some of which have been recognized by the authority of the Church. These do not belong, however, to the deposit of faith. It is not their role to improve or complete Christ's definitive revelation, but to help live it more fully uh, in a certain period of history. The Christian faith cannot accept revelations that claim to surpass or correct the revelation of which Christ is the fulfillment, as is the case with certain non-Christian religions and also in certain more recent sects, which base themselves on certain revelations. Okay, that was a mouthful. But what it's saying is that when the Blessed Virgin Mary appears at somewhere like Fatima, uh, that is not a public revelation in the sense that the whole Catholic Church is obliged to accept it. When the Church talks about public revelation, it's talking about teachings that have been held since the beginning that all Catholics are obliged to affirm, that are held by the Universal Church. Even if the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to 80,000 people at Fatima, that is not something that every Catholic is obliged to believe. That is still a private revelation. That is, it's up to your own private discretion and judgment and reason whether or not you want to affirm that. The Church can tell us Fatima is worthy of belief, that, that the, the Church can propose that it recommends that we uh, affirm what happened at Fatima, but it can't compel us to accept that. And also what the Catechism just said is these private revelations like at Fatima or Lourdes, they do not add anything new to the deposit of faith. They don't propose any new truth. But it contrasted this with certain non-Christian sects or groups, uh, for example, like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, or even Islam, which are all groups which claim to have had another prophet come and deliver an updated version of the gospel, either from Muhammad or, uh, or Joseph Smith in the case of the Mormons, or uh, Mary Baker Eddy uh, in the case of the Seventh-day Adventists. So uh, the Church rejects any claims uh, of any new or updated revelation that claims to surpass or update or alter the once-and-for-all public revelation delivered uh, in the person of Christ and encapsulated in the Church's tradition and uh, sacred scriptures. So, we have to understand that difference between public revelation and uh, private revelation. Okay, so how do we know then, so we got this public revelation that comes to us through the scriptures and the tradition. How do we know how to interpret this uh, revelation? Well, it belongs to the authority of the teaching office of the church, the magisterium, to define how revelation will be interpreted. And by the way, uh, on this very program, we did two excellent interviews with Dr. John Joy, who is the foremost expert in the English-speaking world on 
the uh, on the subject of the magisterium of the church, which is the church's teaching authority. We often talk about the magisterium as a noun, like the magisterium, uh, as it's as it's a group of people, right? Uh, but that's not the case. The magisterium is the authority that is wielded by the church when it when it teaches or interprets our divine revelation, and so. The church has this magisterial authority to define how revelation will be interpreted. And uh, this, this goes all the way back to the Gospel of Luke when, when Jesus says to the apostles, he who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me. So if we want to rightly understand uh, the teaching of Christ, rightly divine the word of God, as it says in the New Testament, we need to seek the apostolic teaching. We need to seek to understand the faith as the apostles taught it and as it has been passed on through their successors and interpreted uh, by the church with its magisterial authority. Now, non-Catholics or people who have a very skeptical view of magisterial authority will say, oh, are you saying I, I can't read the Bible and interpret it myself? Like you're saying I can't study the scriptures? Uh, you know, uh, does this mean Catholics? And then you have all these legends like, well, Catholics used to be forbidden from reading the Bible and, and things like that that are, that are not, not true. Um, is that what that means, that if, if, if it's up to the public authorities in the church to interpret our revelation, that individual Catholics are not supposed to study the scriptures themselves? or, or under, No, that's, that's certainly not true. Individuals are absolutely encouraged to study and internalize the teachings and doctrines of, uh, of revelation. We are absolutely encouraged to, uh, to study the Bible. You've probably heard the Catechism quotes St. Jerome that ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. If you are ignorant of the Bible, if you're ignorant of the written word of God, then you're going to be ignorant of Christ of whom the written word of God speaks. So we are absolutely encouraged to study the Bible, internalize the teachings and doctrines of divine revelation. However, we also have to understand that any conclusions that we draw from private study that contradict the understanding of the church on the interpretation of revelation are in are simply incorrect right so for example the church has authoritatively many many times taught that uh the eucharist is the literal body and blood of jesus christ and that that's how we should interpret the gospels when jesus says take and eat this is my body drink this is the cup of my blood. Or when it says in John 6, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Or in 1 Corinthians, when St. Paul says that it's it's dangerous to, uh, to receive the Eucharist without properly discerning the presence of the body and blood of our Lord, the church has authoritatively interpreted these teachings to mean that the sacrament of the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That is the magisterial teaching of the church affirmed by tradition from time immemorial. And what that means is that if you in your own private Bible study read John 6 and say, well, I don't think that's what it means. I think it's a symbol. Uh, I, I think he, he's just speaking uh, symbolically when he says it's his body and blood. That means that your interpretation is ipso facto incorrect. You have you have exercised, uh, you, you have interpreted the passage incorrectly outside of the tradition of the church, and your interpretation is wrong. So we are not forbidden from reading the Bible. Of course not. Uh, the church encourages us to read the Bible, but what we are not to do is to read the Bible and just come up with our own willy-nilly explanations of what we think it means just because. Uh, we are not our own. We, we don't have magisterial authority. We are not the church. Um, we read the Bible in the light of the church's interpretation, not to make up our own interpretation. We read in light of what the tradition has passed on to us in terms of the meanings of these texts, and then we meditate on them, we ponder them, we let the text change us, we let the revelation work on us. We, remember, we are the clay, he is the potter, the Lord is the potter. We allow the revelation to change our lives. We don't read the text and seek to impose our own understanding, our own meanings on the texts that are just contrary to what Christians have always believed or affirmed. That would be that would be very wrong and also very dangerous, dangerous to our spiritual life, dangerous to our our souls. So that is not something that we that we should be doing. And so hence the catechism says that the task 
of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, paragraph 85. So, a couple things to unpack from this as we wrap up here is, number one, you can read the Bible as much as you want, and you're encouraged to do so, and you can draw all sorts of insights from it. But in terms of the authentic, official interpretation of what divine revelation is saying, whether in written form or in our traditions, that has been entrusted to the teaching authority of the Church alone, which is the magisterium. And it says that its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ, which means that uh, that the Church's interpretation of the divine revelation is, in fact, what Jesus wants us to understand from these texts or from the revelation. It's not just, uh, sometimes people treat the church as teaching the way we approach like political platforms, like uh, like as if the, the church's uh, teaching on a certain subject is just a political policy prescription that if we lobby, if we don't like it, we can lobby against it and, and through the democratic process get it to change. That's not how it works. The church is exercising this magisterial authority in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, who the book of Hebrews says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The teaching of the church does not change, cannot change. So what we're looking to do when we approach scripture or tradition is to acknowledge and gratefully and humbly receive the teaching that has been passed on and then allow it to work in us, change our lives, and to form us in God's image. That's what this is all about. We being formed in the image of Christ, not trying to form our religion in our own image, not trying to make our own Tower of Babel. Well, I set out to talk about the scriptures and I, I barely uh, got through my introduction, so I guess we're just going to have to do another episode on this <laughs> another time. Uh, but it's, it's something to think about. It's something to ponder. The humility with which we need to receive the revelation of God to allow it to change our lives. So I promise you, we will revisit this in the future. But until then, this has been Faith Matters. I am your host, Philip Campbell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. God bless you all. Thank you.